So the big question is, do you prefer curved lines or angular and straight lines in your furniture? For example, do you like this cabinet or this one? What about this one or this one? I mean, would you rather spend the afternoon staring at this boring office building or exploring the beauty of the Cloudgate sculpture in Chicago? In this video, we're going to explore curvilinear design as we build two kick-ass walnut whiskey cabinets with a variety of techniques, from bent lamination with steam bending, CNC carving, and a number of mixed materials like solid brass, epoxy, and leather. In multiple door designs, we hated so much that we had to scrap them and start all over. But these cabinets, they started over two and a half years ago. So you're probably wondering how this whole project came to be and why it took so long. While visiting my good friend Paul from Copper Pig Woodworking up in Boston, we were brainstorming potential project ideas that revolve around the stadium shape that he frequently incorporates into his work. It has such a wonderful balance of curves and straight lines with endless possibilities in furniture design. Now, Paul is a scientist by day, so he loves his research. And what the research shows is that humans prefer curves, not hard lines found in rectilinear shapes. And as the morning coffee started to kick in, we spitballed how the stadium shape could also be used in a larger cabinet and not just in smaller boxes he had made numerous times over. And that's when he pulled this sketch out. I immediately fell in love with it. The shape, the design, and the endless opportunities for customization of the door and all the internal components. And that's when I turned to Paul and said, let's build it. In fact, let's give ourselves even more possibilities for design and build two of them. And that's when the two and a half year journey began. Now I do accept full blame for that extended timeline, but that's all water near a bridge. So far you've seen some walnut slabs get cut down, milled, flattened, and resawn into a bunch of thin strips. Now some of these strips, as you can see, are going to be used to make some custom plywood for the doors. The others will be used for bent lamination to create the cabinet cases. Now when resawing strips for bent lamination, I draw a triangle on the end grain. This ensures all pieces go back together in the same orientation so the edge grain looks as continuous and seamless as possible after glue up. Now when it comes to bending wood, a lot of variables come into play. Species of wood, width of pieces to be bent, how tight the radius is, etc. All of these play a critical role in determining how thin your pieces need to be. Now this was air dried walnut and the width was about 6 inches and the radius was also 6 inches. That's impossible. Six inches. And after several test pieces, I concluded that these strips needed to get down to 3 30 seconds of an inch to safely bend around the radius without cracking or giving too much resistance. Now, I could only go so thin on my thickness planer without making mulch of these strips. So my buddy Alec at Owlhead Woodco was kind enough to let me use his drum sander to get a consistent thickness on all these strips. Now, if you've never seen this before, this is bendable plywood or wacky wood or flexible plywood. What makes it flexible is all the laminations in the plywood are glued together in the same grain direction. But you can buy four by eight sheets with the grain running long ways or the short way. So make sure whatever which way you wanna bend that you get the right plywood for the job. Now for this project, I made multiple identical bending forms because as you will see in a little while, we will steam and pre-bend our laminations and leave them clamped up overnight. This will basically give the wood the hint that it's going to be bent and to start getting limbered up. It's essentially an overnight yoga class for wood. So having multiple bending forms not only gives us the freedom to pre-bend multiple sets of strips, but also glue up multiple sets of strips. I mean, time is obviously of the essence here. Now in the past, I've made bending forms several ways. One out of solid MDF in which multiple pieces are stacked on each other and screwed together. And I've also done the same thing with plywood. I've also done it using a male and female form, but that gets a little more complicated. For this project, I'm going to use a top and bottom Baltic birch plywood layer and fill in the core with individual pieces of hard maple. Honestly, solid MDF is probably the cheapest and easiest way to go especially if you have a CNC to cut all your parts, but it also makes for one heck of a heavy form. I'm arranging these maple blocks close enough so I don't get any flat spots on the bending form. Now, is this over-engineered? Oh yeah, 100%. However, in my defense, bendy plywood, depending on the thickness, has its own maximum or minimum radius that it can bend around. Now this is quarter inch, 
If I went any thicker with this bendy plywood, it would not make that radius without cracking. Now, bendy plywood is a little soft. So if my spacer blocks were too far apart, I could end up with flat spots on my form, which could potentially telescope through and give visible flat spots on the inside of the cabinet cases. Okay, so next up, we're gonna make what you might call a pressure belt. So with a series of blocks glued on to a piece of flexible plywood, when we bend this around our form and clamp, these blocks will help distribute the clamping pressure across our form. So up near the top of the radius, I'm gonna space these a half inch apart, and then as I move down the sides, I'm gonna to switch to three quarters of an inch. So now I have some half inch spacers, and those dabs of CA glue give me instant bond while the PVA glue has time to set up. And finally, the last one. And once those were all glued on, I could flip it over and add some suspenders to that belt. And now to give this thing a test run. Ah, 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 ah. And the one last thing to do was to drill some holes for some clamp. And then I headed north and found the secret entrance to the basement of Derek from Malden. My goodness, he's got a lot of shit down here. Hello? Derek? Hey! hey. Hello, buddy. Once the pleasantries were out of the way, we could start steaming. Now I like to load these strips into the steam box on edge. It's just easier to get them in, and that way they don't start sagging on top of each other. Because nobody wants saggy wood. Right, George? <laughs> <laughs> now it doesn't take long for these to get some moisture and get pliable. About that long, in fact. Now a word of caution. When you open that steam box, that's hot steam. So number one, wear gloves. Number two, have a beard. Or just keep your face back. Now as you can see, steaming does crazy things to those strips. They're all warped and twisted and such. So we wanted to get these bent around the form and as flat as possible, and then let them sit overnight. And the next day it was go time. Total boat, baby. Now we're using total boat high performance epoxy to glue these up. Why? Well, it gives us plenty of open time to get each layer sufficiently covered in epoxy without going into major panic and stress mode that the glue is drying too fast. Now, a couple things to point out here. That bending form you see is actually MDF stacked together. We ended up cutting some more parts on Derek CNC, gluing those up. We also added those backer blocks. They basically look like dorsal fins. What that allows us to do is take the stack of strips and push them up against them and keep everything aligned because that epoxy makes those strips slippery as an eel and very difficult to keep aligned. We also covered the entire form, top, bottom, and all sides with clear packing tape to prevent any epoxy from sticking to it. And bonus points for anyone who can tell me how many clamps we had to use. And the next day was the moment of truth. First, we had to remove, how many clamps was it again? Oh, right, a load. Now there's two things to take note of here. As you can see, we take the clamps off and there was no spring back. And number two, it came right off the mold and didn't stick to it. Oh, hello. Then I packed everything up in the truck and headed 300 miles south back to my shop where I got the fun job of cleaning all these up. Now because these individual laminations weren't perfectly lined up on the edges, I first took one side and put it through the jointer to get them perfectly flat and square. Then over at the table saw, using the utmost care and caution, I could rip a parallel edge on all four of the arches. Now to square up the ends and get them ready for joinery, I just used my crosscut sled on the table saw, and because those edges were square and flat, I could put that right up against the fence and get a 90 degree cut. What do you think, Jerry? Boy, Jerry was a little chubby back then. Now to be joining the two parts of the case together, I'm going to be using the Festool Domino. You could also use a router and make one large, loose tenon, but I think these dominoes will hold just fine. And for this glue up, Total Boat Thixo, thickened epoxy. Rather than using the high performance that could run all over the place, with the Thixo, I have much more control because of the viscosity is higher, Oh, hello, Jerry. And there's less of a chance to make a mess. Now, I did have the domino on the loose setting on one side, which allowed me to get the edges of the cabinet perfectly flush with each other. 
And once the first one was done, I could move on to the second. Now I did have a little bit of an issue with this one. The sides were actually pinching in a little bit. So I built this little plywood box to make sure everything stayed in the correct form and in a straight line while I got it clamped up. And once that was dry, I could use a card scraper just to get any squeeze out off of there, sand it nice and smooth, and then head over to the router table where I could cut a rabbit in the back of both of these carcasses where the actual back of the cabinet will sit, as you can see in that nice little groove. And here is the cabinet back as I glue it up. And to size this to that opening, I'm just placing the cabinet on top of the glued up panel, tracing it, cutting it on the bandsaw, give it a little touch up on the spindle sander, and in she goes. Now I did make that panel about a 16th plus shy to allow for any wood movement. Then I could get started on the custom plywood for the doors. Now, if you don't have a vac bag, all is not lost. You can use some clamping calls and a couple of platens, which I just use melamine and a ton of clamps. Now, one of the last things to do for this project at my shop was to install the fixed shelves. And for these, we decided to use sliding dovetails. In retrospect, tongue and groove would have been perfectly fine because for some reason I have this false idea that sliding dovetails are cool. When in fact, they're just a royal pain in the so I generally make this a two-step process. The first is to use a straight bit to clean out the majority of the material and then come back with the dovetail bit. Otherwise, you're really putting a ton of stress on that dovetail bit, trying to remove that much material at once. I'm using a shop-made edge guide, which allows me to line up that router bit precisely where I need it to be and keeps everything nice and square with the case. To make the male portion of this joint, I'm just standing up my material on edge on the router table using the exact same dovetail bit we used to hollow out the grooves. Now these need to be a stopped dovetail. I don't want to see that dovetail joint on the front of the case. Now that is certainly a look that can be done on other pieces, it just wasn't what we were going for here. Now the reason I'm not using standard PVA glue here is that will swell the joint. And if you've ever cut a sliding dovetail before, they can be a royal pain in the butt to get to fit once that joint swells up. Meanwhile, back at Paul's shop, the doors were underway, so I headed back up there. Now this panel is actually the front of one of the doors, and this design is infused with the Japanese Asanoha pattern. Now to fill the carving, we use brass powder mixed with total boat epoxy with the slow hardener. This allows that epoxy to flow out slower and hopefully eliminate any air bubbles. Once it was cured, we could run it through the planer and reveal the design. At this point, we really liked it. There was such a nice flow of the pattern intermixed with a negative space swirl. And that brass powder had such a nice shine to it. Now then it was time to carve the back of the door. This was not only for design aesthetics, so you would see a different detail when the cabinet was open, but also to balance out the door and prevent it from cupping or twisting. We use the same technique here. Total boat, baby. Using total boat epoxy with the slow hardener, but also adding some black pigment. And now on to the drawers. Now each cabinet will get one drawer. Both are going to be dovetailed. They're going to have a different design on the front, but seeing as how these are dovetailed drawers, I thought there's no better person to let do these than Paul. Anybody but me. Though don't get me wrong, I can hand cut a dovetail. I've done it a number of times. It's just not my favorite thing to do, but Paul absolutely loves cutting dovetails. So who am I to deprive him of that joy. I would feel terrible. And he of course did the traditional beveled solid wood bottom, just lovely. And rather than leaving just the traditional wood bottom inside, Paul wrapped an insert with black leather and inserted that. Very nice. And of course our buddy Eric Curtis had to stop by and flex his dovetail cutting skills. That's how we do in the hood, baby. Uh, you only did one corner, bro. 
And with those drawer boxes cut, we could move on to the drawer runners and the drawer stops. Now this was kind of a design on the fly detail that we thought had potential. And once the runners were made and installed, we could then use some brass rod and make a simple stop. Now in order to remove the drawer once these are installed, the little pins in the runners need to be removed, which is a little bit of a design flaw. So for future cabinets like this, it's definitely a detail that could be improved upon. Now that drawer front you see is also the Asanoha pattern and filled with brass powder and epoxy, but we forgot to film that. Now the negative space at the bottom of the cabinet was originally intended to be a drawer, but instead we decided to use it for storage of the custom coasters that we planned to make. We thought it was a cool idea to have the coasters nest on top of a walnut and leather platform and secure that to a brass post. Just trying to tie all the details together with the walnut and the black leather to the black epoxy and the brass post to the brass powder and epoxy. And that black leather insert nests nicely into that drink platform. And then we could see how it all worked together. We thought it looked pretty good. And in case you were wondering, both of these cabinets will be for sale more details coming on that later in the video. Now for the coasters themselves, we were able to utilize the CNC again. Number one, cutting the circles, and number two, carving the pattern into them that we decided on. And once I had all those edges rounded over, it was a sanding marathon. Sanding end grain is a royal pain in the And then using some black India ink and this brush to burnish it all, you get this beautiful glossy effect on the edges. Now for the solid brass inserts, our buddy Derek from Malden took the wheel on these on his CNC. Now we needed eight of these, so it was a very slow process. But as you can see, they fit in nice and tight, and we love that detail. Now we did have a couple of other designs before we decided on that one, but as you can see, they just didn't look as good. But what was looking good is the black epoxy that was poured into the back of this door. So after it ran through the planer and the drum sander, we could actually get this thing traced out on the cabinet, get it cut on the bandsaw, and then take a look at it. And decided that we didn't like it at all. We looked at it from every angle, from straight on to at an angle to far away and even further away. It was just too whimsical and playful. I mean, for a sophisticated whiskey cabinet, do you guys think this design works? Now, before I take you down our rabbit hole of redesign, let's look at the door design for the other cabinet. Now, the plan for this one was a similar design, but to be a relief carving, no epoxy, and with much less detail, just a couple of swooping curves. And once we got some oil on it and had a chance to step back and take a good look, yeah, we didn't like that one either. But first, let's go back to the brass powder and epoxy door. We started by adding some black epoxy accents. That didn't help. So we started with this, went to this, which morphed into something completely different, and then things started to change. And as you can see, there's a split door design starting to happen, which we liked a lot. So we expanded on it, tried to add some color, and then this shape came into play, which we morphed into this. And that's when we looked at each other and said, yes, this is the one. Now for this door, we wanted to continue that same two-piece design, but also maintain that relief carving that we had. So with the CNC working overtime, we could start bringing our multi-piece doors to life. Now the inlays were easy, but in order to carve the actual door, we needed to size that perfectly to each case first. This would ensure the designs that we were creating fit each door exactly. So once the doors were roughed out on the bandsaw, then it was some hand tool work with the spoke shave and then with the power sander until this happened. That's why I hate that mesh paper. That could have split my darn retina if I wasn't wearing safety glasses. And with that trip to the emergency room narrowly averted, could head over to the CNC and start cutting these doors. Now we're not only cutting the shape here, but we're also cutting a rabbit on one side that will house the panel that we carved. Now when these panels got glued in, we needed to make sure that we left a little bit of room for expansion and contraction. So roughly a 16th to an eighth should suffice. And then the relief carved panel and the brass powder and epoxy panel were glued up and the final results looked like this. And with the doors decided, we could move on to some other important details. For starters, each of these cases was joined as two separate pieces 
and there was that seam or joint right where the two halves met that we wanted to hide or rather highlight with another design detail. Now Paul had a little bit of ebony laying around and in keeping with the whole design aesthetic of brass and darker elements, we thought it would be a great combo to inlay that brass into the ebony to cover up those joints. First thing to do is make a little jig and then cut a groove across that joint. Now the first thing we wanted to do was glue in the brass into the ebony. And yes, all you need is some CA glue, five seconds, and it's secure. Then with a little steel wool, polishes that right up and that looks beautiful. Now the tricky part of this installation was wrapping it around the front edge. So we needed to cut these little pieces of ebony and brass with a miter. So using a crosscut sled to get it pretty much roughed out and then on the disc sander to get it nice and smooth, we could get to work. Now this is where a double set of hands comes in really, well, handy. Now the backside of this inlay was easy. It just needed to be trimmed flush and then filed down smooth. But for that little teeny piece with the double miter, well, that was a little more precarious. I mean, this had to be perfect. There was no room for there to be a gap in this joint because you can't fill it. So it was definitely a bit nerve wracking. But we got it, a little sanding, a little polishing, and it cleaned up real nice. It was not meant to sit flush, by the way. It was supposed to be just a little proud. Now, each one of these cabinets has a drink platform that pulls out with the drawer. And both are slightly different, not only in design, but also in function. Now, both are going to use a magnetic catch system, which I'll show you shortly. But this one is actually going to ride on these brass runners. And Paul, being the consummate hand tool professional that he is, said, Hey, we can't get a router in there? No problem. I'll just use a chisel. And the way this is designed to work is that brass bar will get glued into the side of the case in this groove that Paul is so eloquently excavating. And then the groove in the drink platform will slide along that brass bar. Now for the other cabinet, the drink platform will actually be part of the drawer or rather be housed in this rabbit that Paul is cutting around the drawer. And by the way, this design idea here with these drink platforms was all Paul, brilliant. So the process of getting this to fit uh, requires, uh, in my opinion, hand tools to really dial this in. So now I've added the drink platform to that. And now I want to get it to fit in here. But you see it's binding a little bit because this drink platform is too high and it's rubbing against the shelf. You take this out, you turn on your shooting board and with a very sharp, finely tuned plane, you just take a little bit off the interior just a few thousandths at a time. Okay. You put it back in place and you try it again. Better, I can close it now, but it's still too much resistance. So I will just keep repeating this until it feels really good and that that smooths without binding. Now the hinges were also left to Paul, and being the hand tool masochist he is, decided to leave the router on the shelf and, and cut all the mortises with a chisel. I'll let you enjoy his handiwork. And there you go, no router needed. And so, for all intents and purposes, the overall construction of these cabinets was done. All that was left to do were the miles and miles of sanding and of course the finishing and steaming out any dents or dings that may have been picked up along the way. And believe it or not, this is where the largest gap of time elapsed. From when we pretty much finished to when we just needed about three more days to finish everything. Now we decided to use a couple of different finishes on this. For one, this is polymerized walnut oil. And man, does that bring out the beauty in walnut. Now we're going to use shellac on the majority of these cabinets, but the reason we had to use the walnut oil on this brass powder and epoxy is because the shellac will tarnish it and turn it green. It does not affect solid brass in that way. We have no idea why, but lesson learned. I'm sure there's a chemist out there who could tell us. Now Paul likes to make his own shellac and traditionally homemade shellac is made using shellac flakes and denatured alcohol. But Paul actually uses, and what he taught me, is to use Everclear. Yeah, that super strong alcohol you buy at the liquor store. 
It dissolves shellac flakes beautifully. It's non-toxic. And as you can see, you can just spray it willy-nilly and not even wear a mask. And your Toyota RAV4 parked in the driveway gets another layer of protection. Now, despite shellac's simplicity, ease of use, fast drying times, it doesn't always bring out all the color and figure in walnut. And this door with the carved panel was made with such beautifully figured walnut with a touch of curl that the walnut oil was the best option to bring all that beauty to life. Now, what Paul has figured out with trial and error is you can actually coat the entire piece with walnut oil and then seal it with shellac and it still maintains that wonderfully rich color. So that's what we did. And as you can see here, there were a multitude of parts and pieces that all needed either oil or shellac or a combination of both. And we didn't forget about you, old stadium case. You're gonna get the same buttery rich coating of that walnut oil and then sealed with shellac as well. Now, as I mentioned, that brass powder and epoxy cannot have shellac on it or it will tarnish it. So we did have to mask that off when we were spraying. Now we had toyed with the idea of putting a couple of brass pins in the back here to act as kind of a bumper stop for these coasters, but we decided against it. And now, in retrospect, I kind of wish we had done it. But it's too late now. It was really exciting at this point to see all these details come together and this two and a half year long journey finally come to an end, although it is a bit bittersweet because I just absolutely love working with Paul and Derek. And I think what we created is something very unique and one of a kind. Yes, there are many things that can be improved upon. This is just version one. Now, because the back of the cabinet is pretty much flush with the sides of the cabinet, we had very limited options for hanging. So what we went with was a very low profile aluminum French cleat. And here's a little demo of Paul's genius with this magnetic drink tray. I love this. Hey, look, everybody, it's Justin Maybe from Call Me Maybe. Be sure to check out his documentary series on his YouTube channel. I was actually featured once. Ooh. And in case you didn't know, Total Boat dropped their new CA glue onto the market last month, and it's pretty awesome. And that's all we needed to affix this brass post into that hole. CA glue is surprisingly strong in its connection from brass to wood. Now there was one other detail to add to the backs of these cabinets, and that was an inscription and our logos. And what faster and cleaner way to do it than with the Xtool P2 laser? Yes, Xtool did send me this machine and I am absolutely loving it. It's so versatile and with the riser base, I was able to slide the oversized cabinet backs in secure them to the honeycomb, and let the laser do the work. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this was very stressful. If I didn't have it line up square and in the correct position or something went haywire, I would have had to remake them, but it worked. No, 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 not gonna happen. Wow, why did we even bother making that cabinet? Calm down, Abe. We'll just sell them. Cast! Foiled again. Now, the reason we decided to build these cabinets was not because we had a buyer, but because Paul and I wanted to build something together, and he had such a great idea to work from. We wanted to take both of our strengths as furniture makers and combine them into one project and see what we could create. And when you collaborate with someone else of a different skill set, it's amazing how you can play off of each other and create something exponentially better than what you could on your own. Now, Paul has infinitely more skills on the hand tool side of woodworking than I do, and a much higher design acumen. I'm much more power tool focused and making sure things look perfect, clean, and crisp, almost as if they were made by machine and not by hand. Now it would be impossible to count how many hours Paul and I spent on the phone having creative powwows and discussing design details and how to make them work. And having these design brainstorming sessions with someone else is one of the things that I love most about woodworking. And it was so great to have our pal Derek from Malden work with us on the cases and the custom CNC work as well. So the lesson here, collaborate with other makers. You never know what you might be able to build together.
Yes, we will be selling both of these whiskey cabinets. I'm going to put a pinned comment below that has my contact information and the prices for both. Now these are only available for sale in the contiguous United States. We just won't be able to ship these overseas. So if you're interested, be sure to reach out and one of these could be yours. Now the glasses are included, but sorry, this devil's nectar here, that can't be shipped. Who drinks that stuff?